Hello, friends, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. We're so grateful that you can join us in this way online, but I want to invite and encourage you to come and join us in person every Monday night at St. Timothy Catholic Church in Laguna Niguel, California. You're welcome to be with us from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. in the hall as we dive into the gospel reading for that upcoming Sunday liturgy. We hope that you can join us, but as you're participating here online, please know that you are still part of our community. We love you. And as you're here, please like this video and leave a comment with any questions or reflections or just to say hello, because likes and comments tell YouTube that you like this video and it might recommend it to more people. And we want to get more people engaged in the Word of God and to know about the love that God has for them. Please also make sure you subscribe to our channel so that you are notified anytime we have a new video, not only Bible study, but we do many other things that we would love for you to enjoy and participate in. But without further ado, thank you for being with us. God bless you and enjoy the recording of this week's Monday Night Bible Study. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. We praise you, God, and we thank you, Jesus. Lord, we lift up this time to you this evening in gratitude for the community that we have, the grace of this week, reminding us of the Paschal mystery of the good news of our salvation, that you died on the cross for our sins and that you rose from the dead so that we could have eternal life. And so we pray, Lord, that the words, as always, that we read of your sacred scripture would never be lost on us, but they would be an opportunity, an invitation for us to peel back the layers of depth that you offer us. We pray tonight, Lord, that you would reveal to us in new ways your love, your will, your desire for our lives, and help us to follow you more faithfully. In the ways we are searching, seeking, or confused, afraid, doubtful, we pray, Lord, that you would meet us there. And we ask that if there is any anxiety, nervousness, worry, anything drawing our attention away from this time, that you would cast out and rebuke those thoughts so that we can be fully present to you here as you are fully present to us. Guide us and allow this time to be completely directed by you as we lay it and all of our lives at your feet. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome. We are in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. This is always a Bible study that feels kind of strange because we're in the midst of Holy Week. And we're already going to be reading about the resurrection because that's the reading for the Sunday, which is Easter. So uh, it's both the excitement of the resurrection, but also not yet because we still have uh, the blessing of the Triduum, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, the Easter Vigil, um, our first Easter Mass, and then all of the, the glory and joy of Easter and the, the full season of Easter. So we're kind of in some way getting a glimmer of that anticipation and that joy tonight. So... Um, this is a story that we commonly read in the Easter season, uh, John's account of the finding of the tomb empty. We're going to read uh, the first nine verses. That is our gospel passage for this Sunday. Uh, so first time through, just get an image for what is being said here. Uh, remember, John wrote last of all of the four gospels. He's communicating similar details. Just because John says something that's not exactly the same as Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it doesn't mean it contradicts. It means he already knows that they wrote the things that they wrote. He's adding or emphasizing additional details that they left out. Uh, so as we kind of compare these, or if you feel like you've heard slightly different versions of this, that's because all four Gospels present it in slightly different ways. But the truth of what happened does not change. So uh, if that comes to mind as you read this, um, just be aware of that. Uh, this happens immediately after the burial of Jesus. In this gospel, it is Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea who get his body and secure it and then anoint him with oil, uh, or sorry, anoint him with herbs and myrrh, and they wrap his body in linen, uh, which is something that's very important for us as we, as we read this, um, this account that happens immediately after. So we'll reference back to that, uh, the previous chapter, verses 38 onward. Uh, we're going to start in John 20. First time through, just get a picture for what is being said here. Paint this image in your mind as if you've never heard the story before and see what you notice. 
On the first day of the week, Mary Magdala, Mary of Magdala, came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. And we'll throw in, then the disciples returned home. <laughs> the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So you've heard this probably many times before. Hopefully you have some kind of image in your mind that you've recalled or that you're just forming now hearing it again. The second time through, as always, we're going to listen and see if there's a particular word that stands out to you, a phrase, a detail, something that resonates with you personally. Okay, this is not to theologically interpret the passage and to try and get at what's going on here historically. This is to see what resonates with you personally and specifically. Okay, so this is our second time through John 20 verses 1 through 9. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning, while it was still dark, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, they have taken the Lord from the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there, and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a few moments, reflect on the things that stood out to you. If you're listening to this or watching this later, let us know what stood out to you in the comments. But for those of us here, we'll uh, take a moment to do that. And then when you feel, feel ready, feel free to share with those at your table what stood out to you and why you think it did. What questions do you have about this passage? And then after about 10, 15 minutes, we'll bring it back to the large group and we'll have some time for teaching and Q&A. So if you're at a smaller table, you're welcome to pair up with another one or stay where you are. But um, take about the next 10 to 15 minutes and discuss. So a few things about this passage. First of all, um, I always like to put the New Testament in the context of the Old Testament. And there's a reference here in verse 9. They did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. Now, if you're well versed in uh, kind of the scriptural notation, you'll see at the beginning of verse 9, there's a little letter, a little E. And when you look at the E, there are two references, neither of which are from the Old Testament. So it's saying that there are definitely these scriptures. Um, and then even in the footnote, there are some individual passages that are suggested, but are not technically that clear. And I'll read those for you. But it's clear that even at this time, there was an assumption looking back that, yes, okay, we get it now that Jesus had to rise from the dead, but this wasn't something that everyone automatically assumed or believed. These were prophecies that were kind of more obscure in the Old Testament that we can read them now and we have the benefit of hindsight and we're like, oh, obviously, how couldn't you, how couldn't you know? Because we've only ever known the story of Jesus where he dies and rises from the dead. But remember, they were expecting a Messiah and had a very different idea of who that would be. They were expecting someone to deliver them, not from sin, but from political oppression, 
to deliver them from Rome. And so there was no thought of death um, you know, and or resurrection. That just wouldn't even have occurred to most of their um, concepts of who the Messiah would be. But we do have some references. And so we'll look at some of these that are, are referenced in the Old Testament. Um, and the first is from the prophet Jonah. And I want to start with that one because Jesus actually references the prophet Jonah in the Gospel of Matthew. He gets frustrated that all of these people are coming, these Pharisees and scribes are coming and demanding a sign from him. And Jesus says, An evil and unfaithful generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And you can read those references in Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 and 10 about that. Uh, instance where Jonah is in the belly of the whale, symbolizing this death that he actually died in the belly. It actually says a great fish. Uh, and then is kind of spit up onto the shore as if he is given new life and then off to charge into this mission into Nineveh to save them from sin. And so uh, first is a sign of Jonah. Then we have this reference in the Psalms, verse, uh, Psalm 16, verse 10. And the psalmist is saying, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, to hell, nor will you, de- nor let you, oh my gosh, nor let your devout one see the pit. Let's try that again. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor let your devout one see the pit. So there's a reference here saying that those who are devout to you will not see death. Sheol was the place of the underworld. It wasn't considered just hell. There was a, a concept in uh, Jewish cosmology of the underworld that had two sides. And there was a good side and a bad side. The good side was the bosom of Abraham. The bad side was called Gehenna. Sheol was the word for the whole area. So if you're not going to go to either, well, then where are you going to go? If everybody dies, what's expected to happen? Or this person is referencing that if I go there, I'm not going to stay there. You're not going to abandon my soul to Sheol, to hell, um, permanently. Next is in the prophet Ezekiel. This is one that's not referenced in the footnote, but one that I think is pretty obvious. Ezekiel prophesies in chapter 37, verse 12. God tells him, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, look, I am going to open your graves. I will make you come up out of your graves, my people, and bring you back to the land of Israel. So even though that's not a prophecy about the Messiah, there is a concept that when the day of the Lord comes, when the Lord comes to redeem Israel, there will be a sort of resurrection. There will be new life, that our graves will be opened. And if you remember in the account of the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus dies, what happens? The souls or the the graves of those who had fallen asleep of the saints, they are raised and they start walking through the town talking to people, just risen from the dead at the moment of Jesus' crucifixion. Okay, so there's fulfillment there in Ezekiel 37. And then finally in Hosea, this is probably the most direct reference in the prophet Hosea chapter 6 verse 2, talking about um, what the Lord will do. Um, I'll read a little bit before this. It is he who is torn, but he will heal us. He has struck down, but he will bind our wounds. He will revive us after two days. On the third day, he will raise us up to live in his presence. So again, this kind of three-day resurrection motif is referenced in the Old Testament, but it's very obscure. Okay, So we don't know exactly what the author of the Gospel of John meant by, for they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead, but we have those kind of examples from the Old Testament. And maybe this is even referencing some scriptures that we no longer have access to. Um, But that is part of that Old Testament reference. Um, Some other details that I think are useful. In the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus is buried and uh, put in the tomb, there is a Roman seal placed upon the tomb. And this is uh, at the end of Matthew 27. And it says, uh, the next day, the one following the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that this imposter said, while still alive, after three days, I will be raised up. Give orders then that the grave be secured until the third day, lest his disciples come and steal him and say to the people, he has been raised from the dead. This last imposture would be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, the guard is yours, go secure it as best you can. So they went and secured the tomb by fixing a seal to the stone and setting the guard. 
Putting a seal on something like a tomb, first of all, it was forbidden uh, for those in uh, Judaism to touch anything dead or a tomb, especially on the day of the Sabbath or the day of preparation. It would make you unclean and unable to participate in the Sabbath. And then breaking a Roman seal was a crime punishable by death. And the Roman guard would have been two to four permanent soldiers cycling in and out. So there was always a guard at that tomb. We don't have reference to them here, but we have reference in the other Gospels of the earth shaking, angels appearing, the tomb opening, and the guards being scared off. And in John's account, we have details of what he recounts happened immediately after that. So that puts into context compared to some of the other Gospels. Um, What else do I want to say about this? I want to leave a few things. Uh, so the other thing I want to say um, before I forget <laughs> is this gospel being the gospel for Easter Sunday um, emphasizes the importance of the resurrection. And this is something that it's very easy, I think, to gloss over. Again, it's something like just like the importance of the crucifixion. We see it depicted every single time we enter the church. And the pain of what Jesus went through, the, the bloodiness, the messiness that we talked about last week of what Jesus went through can be lost on us. But that is also true with the resurrection. That yes, Jesus rose from the dead and that is our, our song, our alleluia. And every year we celebrate and we have joy in the Easter season. But St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's verse 17, yes. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is vain. You are still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is vain and you are still in your sins. That's the reality. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, there is no reason for us to be here. There is absolutely no reason for us to be here. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, it doesn't matter if we venerate Mary or we venerate the saints. It doesn't matter if purgatory is real. It doesn't matter what we teach about heaven or hell. None of that can be believed because the person who taught us it would be a fraud for saying that he was going to rise from the dead and not actually doing it. And so if Jesus was not risen from the dead, our faith is in vain. But the cool aspect of that is that if we want to spread the good news, Catholicism is this very vast feast, this very vast collection of knowledge and teaching for 2,000 years. And so it can be hard sometimes when we're trying to evangelize, evangelize people and tell them about Catholicism, where do we start? Do we start with the Eucharist? Do we start with the Pope? Do we start with the authority? Do we start with you know, all of these different things? And Paul is telling us, start with the resurrection. Because if you can prove to someone that a human being actually rose from the dead, then everything that that human being taught must be true. Everything associated with the church that, that human being started must have the authority that he says it does because nobody rises from the dead. It doesn't happen. This is not something that we celebrate every Sunday. Come to St. Tim's next Sunday and we'll see who rises from the dead. And we just pile up all the caskets of the people who have died. Like, that's, it's not that regular. It's not. This is something earth-shatteringly, supernaturally rare and incredible. And if we forget that, then we can get lost in the complexity, a beautiful complexity, but we can get caught up in the complexity of Catholicism. We can fall into scrupulosity. We can make it about certain teachings or certain practices. And it demystifies, it de-glorifies de Catholicism and Christianity as a whole. And it just becomes a way of life, a set of practices. It becomes another version of a self-help program that we do these things because we feel that they're right and they improve our lives. And brothers and sisters, like, that may be true, but honestly, it doesn't matter. And nobody should care about any of this if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And so as we celebrate Holy Week this week and we enter into the, the joy and the mystery of the Easter season, we have to keep that at the front of our mind. This is not just something that we, we go through year after year as a cycle through the liturgical calendar. This is the reason for our hope and our joy. This is the reason we exist this is the reason we show up every day, every week, the reason we go to Mass, the reason we do what we do, believe what we believe, the reason why we even study Scripture in the first place is because the entire person it's about did something incredibly unfounded and miraculous. If he was just another guy, 
the next week we should just read the, the teachings of Confucius because they would be equally as valuable to us. That's the depth and the reality of the Easter season. That's what we have to remember. And so it's, it's beautiful and important to learn our faith and to study scripture and to do all the things that we do. But if it's not infused with the supernatural reality of the resurrection, then there's no reason we should be doing any of it. It's again, it's just at worst rules and regulations, at best self-help that makes us feel good that's relating to some ancient teacher. Just like people read, you know, the Tao Te Ching or the Art of War by Lao Tzu, or again, the teachings of Confucius or the sayings of Buddha. There's things in there that you can glean and be like, oh, that's nice, that makes me feel good. I'd like to live like that. That's all it is. But none of them rose from the dead. That's all I'll say for now. <laughs> really? Sorry to, uh, I blacked out. Um, <laughs> What, uh, what stood out to you? What questions do you have about this passage? There's a lot of other details I didn't touch on, but uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yes? Um, something that you talked about um, is sort of resurrection. Graves are open. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, what happens to those who are cremated, or the ashes, or those that were, uh, the ashes are separated in different places at one time? What is the church now? Yes, yeah, that's a great question. So what does the church teach about cremation? So the church, uh, this is in the catechism, the church says that you, uh, you are allowed to cremate your remains, but you must treat the remains with the dignity of an intact human body. So you must bury them in sacred ground, or you can, uh, for a uh, regular burial, you can also bury them at sea, as long as they're sunk to the bottom of the ocean. So you can also do that with ashes. You cannot scatter them, and you should not separate them, because it would be the same as scattering the body parts of a loved one or separating them, wearing them on your neck, hanging them on your mantle. So if you visualize them as these are the remains of someone who is a sacred individual created by God who has dignity, and you treat the remains as such, then you are free to cremate as long as you're treating them with that dignity. That's what the, the catechism says. That's what the church teaches. Because we believe that God has the power to reconstitute a person's body into a glorified form, whether it is decaying in the ground and rotted, whether it's separated in ashes, and even those who, through no fault of their own, ignorantly separate ashes or scatter them at sea, God absolutely still has the power. It's not like they're depraved or condemned or beyond hope, and God's like, I, this is a puzzle I can't solve. You know, I'm just, I can't find the missing piece. Like God's all knowing. He'll find all the ashes and put them back together. But it's our responsibility, because it, it conveys a message about the human body and human dignity, right? This, the human body, once we die, doesn't become like a trophy or an amulet. It still is sacred and worthy of respect. And it points to the fact that when we respect the human body and we bury the human body, it's one of the corporal works of mercy to bury the dead. One of the spiritual works of mercy is to pray for the living and the dead. It points to the reality that we believe in the resurrection and that we believe one day at the end of time, the second coming, the final judgment, our bodies will be risen and reconstituted in a glorified form and rejoin our souls and will be body and soul fully glorified for the rest of eternity. And so that's something that when we hold to that belief, we, we have an opportunity to teach people about that. But yeah, if you're curious about cremation, you're allowed to do it, it's in the catechism, but there are those stipulations. Yeah, great question. Yes? Um, I can comparing and contrasting this resurrection to like the Lazarus episode. Yes. Where that, he rose from the dead, but well, look at this. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. a, a stone rolling back. We've got angels appearing. We've got the, the head cloth nice and neat. Mm -hmm. and up. It's just, it looks like a victory. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just, it's not arriving from the dead. It's completely, completely different. Yeah. Yeah, and they're in the same gospel for a reason. And in fact, in the gospel of John, it's not just Jesus' teaching that provokes the Pharisees to condemn him to death. They actually seek to kill Lazarus as well. If you look at the account of Jesus entering Jerusalem right before the events of Holy Week, uh, that's what the Pharisees are, are conspiring to do because they see all the people flocking not only to see Jesus but to see Lazarus. Um, yeah, there's an interesting compare and contrast between Lazarus. Lazarus uh, is risen from the dead by another person. Jesus commands that the stone be removed. It's not removed on its own or by the power of angels. Human effort is needed. When Lazarus comes out, he is still bound. 
He needs to be unbound. The cloths are still on him. Jesus did not need to be unbound. And Jesus, here's a distinction. Jesus resurrected. Lazarus was resuscitated. Because Lazarus eventually died again. Eventually he died again. Jesus did not. And his resurrection was by virtue of his own power and his own effort. Whereas Lazarus was only because of the power of Jesus working in him and through him to testify to others as to his divinity and his power as a sign. In fact, the raising of Lazarus is the seventh sign of the seven signs in John, the most profound and powerful. There's stark distinctions to show, yes, Jesus has the power to do this for another person, but look at the power Jesus has in comparison that is unlike a human resuscitation. That is a self-inflicted resurrection where he is made completely new, no longer bound to human death or human limitations. And that is echoed by some of the appearances of Jesus where he can pass through walls and appear in the upper room and still has his wounds and yet is not hurt. Or he can still eat food and yet still is able to walk on water or appear mysteriously um, to the fishermen at sea in John 21. And so all of these things um, compare you know, I think Lazarus is rightly so placed where it is to further shed light on how even more profound what Jesus did is in his resurrection. Matt, is your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Um, last week you mentioned about the crucifix, or one, one, you said the cru- crucifixes that we see aren't as graphic as they mm-hmm. are, but then you also just mentioned that like he still had his wounds. Mm-hmm. So did Jesus have all his wounds, like when he was resurrected? Uh, we don't know. All that we know that he mentions is that he has the wounds in his hands and in his side. We don't have any mention of his feet having wounds. Um, and we don't have any mention of any of the other cuts or injuries from the cross, from the thorns, the crown of thorns, from the beating and the scourging. Um, and I think partly it is to show that like Jesus really is reconstituted. Like if he just showed up still with every wound, it would just look like he like he just had a really hard time and somehow pulled through. Like that's just kind of like, man, you're looking real messed up, but we're happy you're back. You know, there would be no clear sense of the resurrection. And yet if he doesn't have his wounds, A, can he prove it's really him? And B, it does a disservice to the fact that like, look at what I did for you. It's not just um, polished and gone to desensitize you from the reality that your sin put me on the cross. Even in my resurrected and glorified form, you should be reminded at all times that I did this for you. And so it's, it's to give testimony, I think, to the fact that it is him, that he really did rise from the dead. Um, and it's testimony to us, too, that when we die to ourselves and we rise anew in baptism, and even at the end of time when we rise anew for eternal life, it doesn't mean that we will be without our own wounds. That I think I've shared this before. My spiritual director, he always says that a wound can only be two things. It can be infected or it can be glorified. And that has to do with a physical wound, but especially a spiritual wound. That there are wounds, brokenness, attachments within us. And if we do not address them, they fester and they get infected and we turn inward and we try and control it or we, we deviate from the healing that the Lord is calling us to because it's too scary and too painful and we don't wanna dig out all that infected part of the wound to expose it back to the tender hand of the divine physician, even though it will be painful. But when we turn ourselves over to God, it doesn't mean the wound is gonna go away. That in allowing God's healing power to shine through the wound, we glorify him. This is the reason why testimony is so powerful and how we can share stories about, look at what I was doing and look at what God did in my life and how he brought me out of that place of sin and despair and brought me to hope in, his, in, in eternal life. That we're acknowledging the wound and it didn't disappear. There's still the effects of what we did. There's still the reality of how it, it still is part of who we are. And yet we're allowing the grace and the glory of God to shine through it. And so Jesus, by retaining his wounds, he's showing us a path to our own healing. That in order to experience the healing power of the resurrection, it's not away from your wounds, it's through them. There's a beautiful book by Henry Nouwen called The Wounded Healer. The Wounded Healer. If you want to learn more about kind of this 
area of theology and healing, that's a really great place to start. That we can only heal others out of our own woundedness. We can only be sensitive to the wounds of others by acknowledging our own woundedness and allowing those two things to meet. We cannot get to a place where we're like, okay, I love the Lord, I don't sin anymore, and I'm totally great, and no effects of what I did before are uh, around at all. I'm kind of on another level, so I can help all of you poor peons who are still sinning and caught in your despair. Uh, please come to me and I will minister to you. Like, and, and it's funny when we say it out loud, but how many of us accidentally fall into that kind of mentality? You know, we see people, maybe we see celebrities converting to the faith, and there's all this negativity online about like, oh yeah, let's see how long this lasts. Or we see people new to the church, people who maybe don't understand what's expected of them. People who maybe don't fully reverence or understand the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And instead of meeting them where they are, we criticize. We say, oh, I can't believe that they just did that. I can't believe that they dress that way or act that way at Mass. I can't believe that they don't know you're supposed to be here every single week. And we can fall very easily into that position of, I'm up here and you're down there. Because we forget our wounds. And Jesus, from the very first moment of his resurrected appearance to the disciples, wants us to remember, you cannot continue without your wounds. Your wounds will always remain. Your choice is whether they will be infected or they will be glorified. Jared. I was kind of reading before, but I was curious, why did the Jews ask Pilate to break the other's legs? Oh, before this? Yeah. Uh, because they don't want the crucifixion to be happening during the Sabbath. And so uh, when you're when you're crucified, so I've been told, it's never happened to me, um, but how they, they've kind of just studied this is that what you really die of is asphyxiation. And so as you're, you're as I, I think I mentioned this last week, as your lungs fill up with fluid, you have to push yourself up on the nail in your, your legs to take a breath because just the way your, your lungs start to collapse and cave in. So in order to expedite the death of the people on the cross, uh, people would break their legs so they can no longer push themselves up and they essentially asphyxiate that much faster. Yeah, that's why. And it fulfills some of the prophecies in the Old Testament that says like they, um, they will not break his bones. Like not, not one of his bones will be broken. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly, there's some significance to the folding up of the clock in the Jewish tradition. Yes. Yes. So there's a lot of things um, about this. Um, so... Um, Okay, where do I want to start? So when someone is buried, this is why I want to point back to this uh, passage before. When someone is buried, they have a, uh, a linen cloth that is placed over them uh, after their body is anointed and covered with herbs and myrrh. And we have that mention here of myrrh. Myrrh is very sticky. Uh, an equivalent to uh, a practice is if you like use lead to embalm a body. It has this very like sticky, kind of hardens, almost like somewhat mummifies a person or preserves them intact um, for longer. And then you would cover them in this linen shroud and then you would cover their head with a sudarian. It's, it's the word in Greek for a head covering. Uh, and you would place them in the tomb. Uh, and so the fact that this is neatly removed and rolled up in another place is evidence for a lot of things. First of all, it's evidence for the fact that um, the body is no longer there. Because if someone took this body out or this body somehow resuscitated on its own, this cloth would be like super glued to it. It would be very difficult to remove. If someone is there trying to break a Roman seal and not be executed for that, to start some kind of rumor that Jesus had risen from the dead, they're not going to sneak into this tomb very stealthily and dangerously and then start to do this kind of tiny minutia of peeling this thing off. They're going to get that body and get out of there. Okay, so the fact that it's left behind, the fact that it's intact, the fact that it's neatly rolled up in another place shows that Jesus' body was not stolen, that the body indeed is not there, and that Jesus must have freed himself because the effect of the cloth adhering to his skin is completely removed. And then the fact that it is rolled up in a separate place, um, I've heard this compared often to the wedding garment of a wedding feast, that uh, I've used this analogy before, and apologize if it's a, a little grotesque for you, but um, that when two people would get married, uh, one would betroth themselves to the, the man would betroth himself to the wife or he would pledge himself to her. Um, and they were technically legally married, but the man had to go and prepare a place for the bride. Jesus in the last supper in John says, behold, I am going to prepare a place for you. He uses wedding language that there's going to be this covenant between us and him, and he is going to prepare a place for us. 
And then once the place is ready, the bridegroom would come to the home of the bride. He would escort her along with the entire wedding party into this new bridal home. They would consummate the marriage on their marital bed while all of their friends and family waited patiently outside. Be happy that you live in the year that you do. Um, and then they would celebrate with a week-long wedding celebration. But what the father of the bride would do is after the marital act, he would go into the bridal chamber and he would grab the cloth of the bed and keep it as a sign of preservation as evidence for his daughter's virginity because there would usually be blood on the, the marital cloth. And so if at any point there's actually details of this happening in the Torah, that if a husband is dissatisfied with his wife or says that she was not a virgin on our wedding night, that they're brought to the gate of the city and the father has to present evidence of her virginity. How would he have evidence of that? The marital cloth from the wedding night. And so a cloth that is proof of the virginal and intimate love between the bridegroom and the bride, Jesus the bridegroom and us the church, that is stained with his blood, is left as evidence in the tomb for his commitment and his faithfulness to us as he went to prepare a place to us. So there's very wedding covenantal imagery here. That's why in Revelation, heaven is always called the wedding feast of the Lamb. I know there's some other details. There's another significant representation of this cloth, and I cannot remember it. It's on the tip of my tongue. Do you know it? No? Okay, if anyone else knows it, someone asked me this before, and I, I looked something else up about it, and I wish I had written it down in my Bible. I cannot for the life of me remember what it is, but hopefully it will come to me, or it just doesn't matter. But those are the things that come to my mind, at least very significant details, evidence for Jesus' resurrection, very wedding marital imagery that has evidence of Jesus' faithfulness to us, that he is honest and true in what he said, that I will go and prepare a place for you, that I will be risen after three days, and he leaves that behind as proof of that very similar to the proof left behind after a wedding ceremony. Yes, Chrissy. I had a question like sort of in that same vein. I thought it was interesting that the head cloth was separated from the shroud. Yeah. Um, and then to this very day, it seems like they're in different countries, like the yes. in Spain, mm -hmm. and then the shroud is in Italy. Do yeah. you know much about that, like why they remain separated or... Uh, I don't. I think they were just venerated in different places. They ended up there. Um, so that we have both of these garments. The Sudarium of Oviedo is in Spain, um, and it is the facial covering of, of Christ. And then, uh, and then the Shroud of Turin is the famous burial cloth of Christ. They've done spectral analysis of both of these artifacts, and there's actually some very cool similarities between, uh, there's very striking exact similarities between the blood and injury patterns on the Sudarian and on the Shroud of Turin that match if you were to lay them over a body, one on top of the other. And so they kind of show that they fit together almost like uh, archaeological puzzle pieces with the same blood stains and, and patterns of injury. Uh, and so you can look online, they have 3D maps of the injuries around Jesus' head from the Sudarian, how they soaked into the Shroud of Turin, how we know exactly how many injuries he had based on the number of cuts and things like that, and, and all these incredible things about the, the Shroud of Turin. There was a, a myth that was going around from a scientific study that said that it was a medieval forgery, that the Shroud of Turin was a medieval forgery. And the reason for that was that the Shroud of Turin was damaged in a fire in the medieval era, and it was repaired. And when these scientists were given permission to study fragments of the Shroud of Turin, they were instructed not to take samples from the edges where those repairs had been done, but they did it anyway, and they tested them and shown that they were from the medieval era, and then they said, this must be a forgery. But when modern analysis has been done of the Shroud of Turin, everything, when it's done according to the, the instructions that are, they are given to get the most accurate analysis, everything points to it being authentic to the time of Jesus, the region of Jesus at 2,000 years old. And there's incredible scientific studies uh, that have been done. In fact, Father Robert Spitzer was here once giving a talk on the Shroud of Turin and how uh, the amount of light, uh, like radioactive light needed to imprint the type of image, like a photographic negative image of Jesus that exists on the Shroud of Turin, uh, the amount of ultraviolet radiation needed uh, is surpassed by any amount of technology we have on Earth today combined. That we would not be able to replicate it or make a forgery like this at any point in history so far. The only thing in our solar system that has the ability to exhibit that much light and radiation is the sun. And yet, in a fraction of a second, you can actually, I, I don't want to get into the science of it because I'm going to misdo it and I'll just get too excited and I don't know the terminology, but like, you can see like from the layers of how the negative is in the fibers that there's actually, you can see how the movement of radiation went through the garment. 
in almost like a three-dimensional pattern. They've done like crazy maps about this online. So read up on the modern uh, studies of the Shroud of Turin. And I think if you go to our YouTube channel, you can still find uh, the recording of Father Robert Spitzer's talk here um, that he did on the Shroud of Turin and its evidence as a major piece of evidence for Jesus' resurrection and its historicity. So yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, okay, cool, yeah. Yeah, so the he saw and believed, what is that a reference to in verse 8? Again, he sees the burial cloth separated. And a lot of biblical scholars take that as evidence that, okay, why would that be separated if someone had come and taken the body? Because that's what Mary Magdalene goes and says. She says, someone took our Lord and we don't know where they have brought him. And then they go there and they see that the body's gone, but the, the linens are still there. So this is a reference to his belief that something supernatural happened, that Jesus was not taken, that he was indeed risen from the dead. But they, he's only believing that now because of verse 9. They did not yet understand up to this point that Jesus, they didn't expect it to happen. Yeah. So it's not saying he saw and believed, but he didn't understand what he believed. He's saying up until this point, they did not yet understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. But at this moment is when he saw and believed that something like that occurred. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Luke. Uh, just real quickly, so falling off of that, does that mean that they just walked away and didn't tell Mary? Just left Mary there to cry about it? Yes, because if you keep reading, uh, she's there, uh, in, uh, stayed outside the tomb weeping. And then as she weeps, Jesus appears to her first. Yeah. So not very chivalrous on the part of Peter and the other disciple, just like they leave. But the reason why she goes and gets them, remember, the testimony of a female was not admissible in court. So if you wanted to prove definitively that something happened, Peter, who's the leader, and another male disciple run to the tomb to verify so that they can give proper testimony to others that they will take seriously that something supernatural happened. Okay? Mary Magdalene's not on her own because when she comes back, she says... We don't know where they put him. Even though she's the only one mentioned, it's later the context shows that she was with a group of women. And all the other gospel accounts show that there's a group of women that goes to the tomb. She's the only one that's mentioned probably because it highlights the interaction she has very shortly thereafter with Jesus. And there's a very clear distinction between Adam and Eve in a garden and the new Adam, Jesus, and the woman, Mary Magdalene, that's what he calls her, uh, woman, why are you weeping? and kind of a restoration of Eden because they are in a garden tomb. So it's kind of a thematic thing that John does, pointing out Mary Magdalene, kind of tracking her throughout the story. Doesn't mean other women weren't there, but to him, she's the one that's important and worth mentioning. Yeah, yes? Um, I need a little bit better like, clarification with the difference between a covenant and a tes uh, testament. Uh, they actually mean the same thing. So uh, a covenant is a exchange of persons, and it was a Several covenants were made by God with humanity in the Old Testament as a means for which to redeem us. But we always fell short of our end of the covenant because we're imperfect. So God had to come down in the form of, of, of man as Jesus to kind of make both ends of the covenant. The word in, uh, a word in Greek for covenant is testament. And so when we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're talking about the Old Covenant and the new covenant. Remember, Jesus says at the Last Supper, this is the blood of the new covenant that I will shed for you. He's establishing something new. So the New Testament is detailing the writings about that new covenant. The, uh, another word that's synonymous for this, the word covenant, I believe, in Latin is sacramentum. It's where we get the word sacrament. So all seven of the sacraments are meant to be our modern experiences of covenants with God. And that's what happens in every sacrament. There is an exchange between us and God where we are committing ourselves to him in a very specific way. And him and his faithfulness is pouring out gifts or forgiveness or healing into our lives, depending on what the sacrament is. Yeah. Yes. Every week we testify to the fact that we believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, maybe I just forgot, but where in the in scripture is that promise that, that we, we will resurrect um, so anywhere Jesus talks about the final judgment, um, so like I'm thinking about Matthew 25, the judgment of the nations, that some will go into uh, the gnashing of teeth, what, whatever you did to my least brothers of mine, you did to me, and those who uh, are faithful, who minister to him, let's see the exact language he uses. 
Um, Matthew 25, he says, um, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come to you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So it's nuanced language. But, you know, he uses, that's a parable version of that. But he, all over, especially toward the end of his teaching um, discourses in all of the Gospels, will get more toward talking about the end times and the final judgment. And so that's where you'll find a lot of that language. So Matthew 23 through 25, um, toward the end of John, like John 12 through 17, and part of his priestly prayers in the Last Supper discourses, you have references to that. Uh, and then, again, toward the end of his teachings in Mark and Luke as well. You'll find them there. And you don't have, probably have time for it right now, but... Maybe in the future you can tell us what our bodies will be like after the resurrection. Oh, I, I know what they'll be like. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas says that. We've talked about it when we talk about the transfiguration. Remember that um, our bodies will have um, um, subtlety, agility, impassibility, and uh, clarity, radiance. So uh, impassibility, they will not die. They'll be immortal. Uh, agility, they will not be bound by the laws of physics. Subtlety, they will not be obscured by physical objects uh, or um, restrained in any earthly way. And clarity, they will shine. We will be radiant. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas says, that evidence of, the res evidence of the transfiguration and Jesus presenting himself momentarily in glorified form presents for us a glimpse of the hope that is to come for us. Greg. Just the head cloth goes over the heaven first, right? Uh, actually, I think it goes over second, but I'm not sure. It might go over first. Because the reason I say that, when you see image of the Shroud of Turin, mm -hmm. the depth of the impression of the head as well as the rest of the body all seems like at the same level. Yeah, like yeah, I think it goes on second. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know for sure. I don't think I have it in my notes here, but I do think it goes over the burial cloth. But I could be wrong about that. Yeah. Plus, I think the image having such spectral ultraviolet radiation, I don't think one layer of linen is really going to affect, you know, you know. But the blood spatter, it might. So that would be something where you would see evidence of that. Yeah. Did you have something, John? Yeah. I'm probably a loaded question, but how do you maintain the, uh, like, like the hypostatic union that we have this divine person human nature now mm -hmm. and then we say that this this person Jesus dies mm -hmm. and like how do you not how do you not break that union yeah maintain the personhood of Jesus Christ who is a divine person not a human person with two natures because it seems like okay you have this you have this corpse now mm -hmm. do I adore this corpse mm. is this God yeah it, seems like it's not mm. because I mean in the human person when you die and we don't refer to the person as in the floor yeah we, we, we know their animation is in a spirit yes so if they're in hell or in heaven they're, they're there yeah the body is just there for the ride you know? yeah but in Jesus case there's this hypostatic union and so we have to maintain that otherwise we sort of break them apart like the Nestorians would have done yeah so it's like I, that, that's always been challenging. I know that, that God died. It's like, yeah. I don't know. It's, yeah. It normally like, talks about it Easter, but it's pretty relevant. Yeah. Yeah, so the answer is yes and no. That he died in a human sense because he's a human nature, but a human being is both body and soul. And that those two things, though they may be temporarily separated, cannot be separated in terms of the unity of the person. That where there is the body, there is the person. Where is the soul, there is the person. That is why they'll be reunified in our resurrected bodies for eternity in heaven. So even though right now, temporarily, those who have died and are in heaven, they're separated from their bodies, we have the practice of the veneration of relics. And so saints who have lived holy lives, their bodies are considered first-class relics, and supernatural healings and experiences can happen when people have contact with them. And so even though their soul is not there, there is still a presence of the human nature in that person that allows that connection between body and soul to be realized and their kind of eternal glory in heaven to be kind of soaking through into our temporal world um, in their human, human nature. So the same thing would be true of Christ, that he, didn't, he, did, he was always somewhere, you know, right? When he died, the moment he died, he went down to those in the bosom of Abraham to proclaim the good news to them. And then he ascended them and then he rose from the dead. And outside of our temporal space, time is relative. 
you know, it's not necessarily linear or the same amount of time that we experience here. So uh, again, we don't want to fall too much, like St. Paul borders on this, where he almost separates body and soul, when he uses this language of like um, the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit. And that led to, for a long time, this idea that you had to like, anything earthly was bad. Like the puritanical culture, you know, like you can't do anything pleasurable or anything good or anything bodily. That's evil and icky and bad. And it's only Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And Catholic theology and Jewish theology reminds us like you are a body and a soul and that you experience who you were created to be. You experience God through both and that they cannot be separated from one another even though they may be geographically separated temporarily, they are still united and encompass the entirety of who you are. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I can see one application of string theory of action at a distance. Oh, dude, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, we're not going to get into that. I'll get too excited. Okay, and we're over time already. We don't want to start talking about M theory and nine dimensions and all these things. So, um, what we didn't get into is who is the other disciple who Jesus loved? It's supposed to be John but it's probably not. Shocker. Shocker. Very, very quickly, we know that the disciple uh, whom Jesus loved is probably not one of the 12 apostles because seven of them are named elsewhere before this, and then Zebedee's sons are mentioned not as one of the disciples who Jesus loved, but mentioned under a different title in the next chapter in John 21. And that leaves three other disciples, Matthew, James, and Simon the Zealot, none of whom are named John. John was a very common name at this time. One in 20 people on average had the name John. It was one of the names of one of the Maccabees, and they were a very heroic uh, family. And so a lot of people named their children after them, Judas, Simon, John. These names probably sound familiar. Uh, and so there were a lot of Johns. Uh, I have proposed the theory that this could be Lazarus, because the first time the uh, disciple whom Jesus loved is mentioned is in John 13, two chapters after uh, Lazarus is raised from the dead. And when Mary and Martha go to Jesus, they say, the one who you loved is dead. However, there is a very strong tradition showing that Lazarus, uh, after he was resuscitated, him and Mary and Martha to escape further pr uh, persecution from the Pharisees, went to, I believe, Crete, and he became a bishop there. Um, and he did not end up in Ephesus. He did not end up in, with the care of Mary. He ended up dying of old age. Very, very educated, uh, very kind of uh, priestly duties. In, in, uh, in John 18 of this account, Peter cannot get into the courtyard of Caiaphas, and the disciple whom Jesus loves talks to the high priest, and the high priest knows him. Why would the high priest know some fisherman from Galilee? And so there's uh, textual evidence from the early church fathers that this John the Apostle got confused with another John who's called John the Presbyter or John the Elder, who was a priest who focused uh, the attention of the Gospel of John on Jerusalem because that's where he's from. He has this knowledge of the high priest because he is a priest himself. And uh, in the second century, Polycrates writes about how John was a priest. Uh, he's also associated with Ephesus. Um, Papias, one of the church fathers, or Papias, I don't know how to say his name, uh, he talks about how there's two tombs of St. John in Ephesus, that there was confusion between these because one is John the Elder and one is John the Apostle. Um, and then St. Jerome in um, the early centuries attributes second and third John to John the Elder, um, that he writes in a similar tradition um, and that he's part of that Joanine literature. It had become believed that John the Apostle had written this but it is believed that it could be a historical misnomer, that because so many people were named John, he was accidentally attributed this gospel. So the disciple whom Jesus loved, we don't know if it's John, probably isn't, um, could be somebody else. And then the author of this gospel could be someone else also entirely. The reason I bring that up is anytime you see that line, the disciple whom Jesus loved, recognize that is also you. You are the disciple whom Jesus loved. And anytime you read these passages, it's an invitation to insert yourself into the story of Scripture. And so as we travel through Holy Week, as we anticipate the joy of Easter, I really encourage you to read this story and imagine the feelings that you would feel if you were in the position, racing Peter to the tomb, and in your youth and virility, beating that old man to the tomb so that you could get there first and see the evidence of it. And then you could write about it over and over again about how you beat him in a race and how proud you were of yourself. Um, but also to experience just that joy and exhilaration and excitement of maybe this isn't the end of the story. Maybe something supernatural really did happen here. And in the words of Paul, if it didn't happen, your faith is in vain.
So let's remember that as we enter into this Easter season. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We praise you, God, and we thank you so much for the gift of this time, the gift of your word, for all of the things that we talked about and so many others that we did not get to, to remind us that Scripture is so rich in its depth and in its layers, and we can never exhaust the beauty and complexity and the truth that lays in these pages. And so we pray, Lord, that you would invite us to read your word daily, that you would compel us to have the energy and the desire to encounter you in it as often as possible. And especially as we, we journey through this holiest of weeks, that we would not let it be lost on us for one moment, what you suffered and endured for us, how you got down and washed feet, how you instituted the Mass for our salvation, how you died for our sins, how you were buried, and how you rose from the dead so that we know that we can believe that you are who you say you are and that we too one day will rise with you for eternity in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for that gift, a gift that is so undeserved, and yet you give it freely out of love. And so we pray, Lord, that we would freely respond in faith to you so that we can, we can accept and live out that gift of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of our baptism that saves us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your salvation, the gift of faith, the gift of your word, and the gift of this holy season to remind us of all you've done for us. Bless us each in the ways we most need it this week, and we pray all of these things in your most mighty name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.